Ready? I am. Oh, uh, <laughs> before we start, uh, how do you pronounce your first and last name? It's a good question. <laughs> it's Ayelet, so the emphasis is on the yeah, Ayelet, Fishback. Fishback, okay. And anything I should know about how to pronounce your name? Uh, no, it's it's uh, pretty simple. Gil Epen. That's what I thought, Gil. Yeah. Excellent. Ready? Yes. My guest today is Aylet Fishback, who is Professor of Behavioral Science and Marketing at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business and the past president of the Society for the Science of Motivation and the International Social Cognition Network. She's an expert on motivation and decision making and the author of Get It Done, Surprising Lessons from the Science of Motivation. Welcome, Ada. Thanks for having me, Gil. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So as I mentioned, we have some technology challenges. Um, so I'm trying to do this with my iPhone. Hopefully the quality is good. Uh, so I picked up some of your papers, um, recent papers. They all sort of uh, move into your book that we will finish up with. Uh, so the first one is, uh, you think failure is hard, so it's learning from it. Uh, you say here, society celebrates failure as a, as a teachable moment, but do people actually learn from failure, you ask, although lay wisdom suggests people should, a review of the research suggests that it's hard. I always wondered about this, <laughs> so in Silicon Valley, the culture is, you know, you got to fail five times, before you succeed. And there are only few Silicon Valley firms I know who have succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are million firms that fail that we don't know anything about. So um, I never felt comfortable with this idea that you go fail and you learn from it and you ultimately succeed. I don't think it works, does it? I, I completely agree. Uh, and it's interesting that you started with the example of not learning from the failures of, of others. And the reason that we don't learn from, <coughs> sorry, the reason that we don't learn from the failures of others is that they don't share it with us. Okay, so you don't hear about all uh, uh, these people that were struggling, these companies that did not do well. Uh, and so uh, uh, it's very hard uh, to learn. Uh, in my research, I also find that it is hard to, to learn from your own failure, not because the information is not there, okay, obviously you were there and you, you noticed that things did not uh, work out, uh, but we, we tend to tune out. So the, the response to, to failure or to setback is often to uh, uh, brush it off, ignore it, uh, move on. In studies that Lauren S. Chris Winkler and I uh, went that, that looked at how much people don't learn from failure, we often presented people with a very simple learning task. Okay? Uh, th there was just like a binary question. Okay, So that is, there is a question of, for example, here's a symbol in a language that you don't know. Does it mean an animal or, or an object? Okay, And you're just guessing. And if your guess was correct, later on, on you know the answer if your guess was incorrect uh, later on you usually don't know much better than chance you are you are still guessing uh, in a way once people got the failure feedback they just tune out they they just uh, uh, stop pay attention to the task uh, they did not uh, remember their initial answers uh, they uh, did not learn the, the correct answer so yeah, it's it's hard to learn from failure. It's hard to learn from failure. Um, and, and I was wondering, um, from an evolutionary perspective, I would imagine if you failed, you get wiped out. So there is a success bias in the human population today. And I wondered if that success bias is one of the one of the issues that we have, you know, we, we didn't have a chance for 100,000 years. We didn't have a chance to learn from failure because the lion basically ate you <laughs> if you failed. 
uh, in the modern world, only maybe 100 years, 200 years, we get a chance of coming back from a failure. And that's a modern phenomenon. So maybe that's not well understood. That's an interesting possibility. I, I think that most of our failures are uh, uh, quite minor. Okay, so even uh, uh, in ancient times, uh, uh, maybe you, you ate something that uh, uh, gave you the stomach ache, okay, or uh, uh, you, you tried uh, uh, to, to explore uh, some environment and it turned out that there was uh, uh, not, nothing there. Okay? So uh, not uh, every failure is uh, uh, that dramatic in our you know, modern uh, lives. Uh, it's you know, like, you, you applied for a job and, and you didn't get it, or you worked on a project and it didn't work out, or, you know, as a scientist, okay, we, we run experiments, and as everybody knows, or at least should know, most of the time these experiments don't work, okay? Most of the time you get results of absolutely no interest. From time to time you land on an interesting phenomenon and then you, you have a, a discovery. And so, so failures are much more mundane and, and part of everyday life. The reason that it's hard to, to learn from failure is, uh, is not that it's not there. It's also not that it doesn't convey useful information. It does. Okay, Often failure has really good information for us. The reason that we don't learn is that it's harder cognitively and emotionally. And, and let me explain. Cognitively, it's easier to learn from success because this is what you expected. Okay, you, you did something expecting it to work out and it worked out and you already have the explanation for why it should work out. This is why you did that. Okay, You applied for a job, planning to get that job. You did everything right. Okay, You, you wrote the, your resume in the best way. You uh, uh, did your best on the interview and you got the job and you know why. Okay, And so you learn. Uh, when things don't work out as you you plan, uh, well, it, it's hard to learn because you, you kind of uh, did not expect that to happen. Also, learning from failure is often learning what's not. Okay, so instead of repeating what you did before, now you have to try the other thing. If it's not on the right, then you should check on the left. If the answer is not A, then you should uh, try uh, B. And this mental switch can be hard. This is before I moved to emotional uh, barrier. Uh, the emotional barrier is that failure stings, okay? It doesn't feel good. And one way to protect the ego is just not to engage with the uh, uh, information, just uh, uh, ignore it and move on. Uh, and so we see that even if people can master the, the cognitive aspect of learning from failure, they often choose not to just because it doesn't feel good. and they don't want to engage. We want to engage. So there, there's ego involved there. Um, in the past, it was survival. Now it's more ego, which is a modern construct, uh, I would imagine. Um, so when your ego get, you know, sort of uh, bent, so to speak, <laughs> you, you, you want to discard the information because it's just painful. To really think about it, right? Yes, yes, and uh, I, they, you know, in, in this situation, okay. So you, you feel uncomfortable. You, you want to to ignore the situation. You want to to forget about that. Uh, you can uh, either completely forget about what happened. Okay, you you just you don't register that. You don't remember. Okay, uh, or you can say this is not for me. Okay, I'm not good at it. Okay, this is not the kind of thing that I do. And and often we see that uh, novices, like when they have a, a failure experience and an unpleasant experience, they say, "Well, I, I I'm not good at it. I I'm not good at chemistry. I don't want to ever try that uh, again." Uh, which is uh, uh, the wrong lesson from from failure. Yeah, so so I want to go to another paper that you have, recent paper, uh, motivating personal growth by seeking discomfort. You say here, achieving personal growth often requires experiencing discomfort. What if instead of uh, tolerating discomfort, people actually sort, sort it out? Um, uh, because discomfort is usually experienced immediately and is easy to detect. And we suggest that uh, seeking discomfort as a signal of growth can increase motivation. 
Uh, I can bit relate to this, uh, Elit. So I came from South India to uh, to Chicago at Northwestern in the mid eighties. Um, temperature never dropped below eighty degrees. <laughs> I came from in Chicago, as you know, is uh, pretty cold, and I was totally motivated, you know, to to take what I got to to go places and uh, discomfort is actually a strong motivational aspect, isn't it? Yeah, well, I, I like that you uh, connected the, the, the paper with uh, Lauren on not learning from failure to the paper with uh, uh, Kaylin Woolley, which is about uh, seeking discomfort and, and seeking uh, uh, negative experiences, because in my mind, they are uh, also connected. So we you know, we see that when unexpected failure happens, uh, uh, people don't learn from it. Uh, we see that people are often much more likely to engage in something that that feels good. And then we have a problem because often we uh, we need to embrace some discomfort. And often the, the discomfort happens even for things that we will eventually enjoy. Okay, And so Kayleen Woolley and I, we were interested in in getting into a new task that will eventually feel right for you, that that has the potential to be uh, rewarding. We were starting by studying uh, how people get into improvisation and that the second city improv club here at uh, uh, you know, in yeah. Chicago uh, is, is a famous improvisation club and, and people go there not in order to, not just in order to, to learn how to uh, be uh, actors, uh, but also because they just want to build their self-esteem, they want to uh, uh, learn the skill. And then the first time that they do it, they feel embarrassed. Okay? They, it, it just feels bad. And if you have never tried to do improv, you go there and they ask you to be spontaneous and you don't feel spontaneous and they ask you to do things with your body and, and to say things and, and, it, and it just feels awkward. And we we thought, how can we get people to, to pass this phase? How can we get them to engage? And it turned out that what works is that you tell people, don't just embrace the discomfort, search for it, okay? Mm. Your goal is to feel uncomfortable. Okay? And we really tried that just with uh, people that were uh, studying improv. And we told them, your goal for this exercise is to uh, experience discomfort, okay? So it, it's not about tolerating, it's about seeking it out. And once you seek it out, then when you feel uncomfortable, that's a good sign, okay? That uh, I, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, okay? My goal was to make myself uncomfortable, and here I'm uncomfortable, so I, I'm I'm doing it right. Uh, so, so that was a, a way to get people to engage their way, then also uh, more interested in taking risks, in, in learning uh, uh, new skills, in coming back and, and doing more improv. Uh, we then move beyond improvisation to uh, getting people to read information that they are uncomfortable with. Okay, so learning about the the political views of uh, uh, people that disagree with you, or you know, uh, uh, all the other kind of uncomfortable information that is on the news. We're reading about gun violence. Uh, we got people to engage in a, a writing task where you reflect on things that were harder for you, basically getting people to reflect on, on their failures, okay, on their uh, discomfort. Yeah. With just this instruction, your goal is to feel uncomfortable. Now, we don't want people to feel uncomfortable in the long run, okay? We set that short-term goal to get people to engage, okay, to get beyond the immediate discomfort so that you can get to the stage where things feel actually quite comfortable. Yeah, so it's a bit of a personality question here, right? I mean, you're teaching MBA uh, students at Booth, and um, so when I went there, I was an engineer. Uh, I was totally uncomfortable, um, you know, standing, raising my hand and asking questions or anything like that. I, you know, basically sat back in the in the classroom, tried to learn something. Um, there is a personality question there. There is sort of a, a history uh, question. There is uh, cultural questions around this. So, uh, I mean, this is a bit outside your research, but how do you deal with such diversity of people going into business school? 
Yes, you know, what's uncomfortable for one person might be very comfortable for the other person, right? And uh, when we talk about uh, uh, background uh, uh, that is different, we talk about diversity in uh, in people's uh, uh, cultures, uh, uh, you know, in everything that they, they bring to the table. And, uh, uh, and this is the fun thing about uh, uh, teaching and about uh, uh, interacting uh, with, with people, about learning from people and, and teaching people that they are not uh, the same person. And I'm thinking about how to address your question. I kind of... I think it would be a nightmare if I stood in front of a class of, of 65 people that were all from the same place with the same yeah. like background, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, can you imagine? Like, it, what, what are we going to talk about? They will all have the same ideas. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, so yes, we can. we embrace diversity. By the way, there is much research showing that diversity of opinion is uh, uh, what uh, makes decisions better. And and we actually, when we teach decision making, when we teach in particular making decisions in a team, we develop methods of making sure that we don't lose this diversity. That we don't get ten people to think like one person. In which case, we are losing the brain power in the room. Right? We. We no longer have 10 uh, views, uh, we just have one view. Yes, I, I want to touch back on that. So uh, um, before that, I, I want to go into another paper that we have, social exploration when people deviate from options explored by others. So you say here people often face choices between two between known options and unknown ones. Uh, Russes documents a social exploration effect People are more likely to explore unknown options when they learn um, when they learn about known options from other people's experiences. Yeah, I can very much relate to this. Um, every time I try to get something working, my inclination is to break it <laughs> <laughs> because it doesn't make sense anymore. Um, but 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 do you see? Um, do you see sort of categories of people uh, in here? It's sort of a cultural question, right? Are all people like this? There are always individual uh, differences, and uh, there are often cultural differences, although we did not find a difference between uh, China and uh, the US with regard to the effect that I'm about to describe. So what is social exploration? <laughs> Uh, social exploration is the, the effect by which we tend to explore in a group. We tend to explore in a group uh, more than uh, uh, by ourselves, which means that when I think about whether I should try something new, whether it's a, a, a new food or like a, a new way to, to get somewhere or, you know, in, other in our studies, it's often whether I will choose to click on, on a box that no one tried before to see uh, whether there is a something good in that, uh, that virtual uh, box. Uh, this is something that people are more intuitively do in groups, which means that if I'm doing it with you and you explore some options, uh, you clicked on some boxes, then I am more likely to click on other boxes other than go to the boxes that you already clicked. Right. Uh, we compare it to uh, an experimental condition in which I just learn what is in some boxes. So instead of playing with you and seeing that you're exploring these boxes, like the experimenter is telling me, this is what you can find in this box. Do you want to get this prize or do you want to explore something new? And uh, uh, when when there is no social context, when we are not doing it with other people, uh, we are less explorative. Okay? We we often tend to just go with that. Whatever we. Uh, uh, now uh, works, okay, whatever is, is already uh, there. Uh, yes, and, so, and so that, yes. No, no, so, so, so there's clearly an exploration bias um, of the contemporary humans, right, the 8 billion that we got. We are here because, probably because we explored or our ancestors explored, uh, and those who didn't explore probably didn't survive in some sense. So there's an exploration bias in the in the current population, do you think? Yeah, well, I, th I think that, uh, yes, we are curious, okay? Uh, by the way, 
all animals are curious, okay? They they will go places just for the sake of, of exploring, okay? So, you know, even if there is no expectation that uh, there will be any prize, any like, food or an opportunity to mate, uh, rats will still explore the maze, okay? And we as people will go places just because we are curious to, to see what's uh, uh, there. Uh, what is interesting is that we often organize our exploration in, in a group, okay? We, we are often very attentive to what you tried so that I can try something else, right. okay? And so, uh, you know, we saw in uh, uh, some uh, earlier uh, studies that if you say that you like something, let's say there are two food options, and you say that like, you really like that dish, then I'm likely to get it, okay? But if you are having that dish, then I'm actually more likely to get the other dish. <laughs> yeah, <right>. Okay. <laughs> now, what's going on? It, it's not that I want to, uh, uh, you know, disagree with you. Okay. It's not driven by a desire to disagree about which food is best. It's like, how about we try the two options on the menu? Okay. We can, you know, exchange uh, uh, notes. Uh, uh, we can tell each other. Okay, how much we, we liked it. Now, you, you might be uh, thinking about, uh, you know, some Indian meal where we can share our dishes, but we explored it in situations in which there is no sharing. Okay? And this is work with uh, Yan Ping too. Uh, so, you know, we, we look at like flavors of chewing gums. Okay? If you are taking one flavor, I, I will take the other, uh, even though obviously we cannot share that food. Uh, but we, we kind of explore the, the two flavors that we're here. Okay, exploration is very much something that a group does. We yeah. group, we need explorers. Okay, you are you know, referring to the the evolution uh, evolutionary roots of of this. It's likely that we needed some explorers in in the group. Okay, some people had to explore new territories, try out new uh, foods. Okay, see what else is is there, and. The society is organizing itself around it such that like if if I explore one thing, then you will explore the other and together we'll have right. the information. Yeah, we need some standard deviation in the sample, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. Um and, and that seems like it's it's sort of designed in. It might have had some sort of survival benefits, right? So you know, if, if everybody went in one direction, everybody went east. They got all eaten by the lion. You know, if you went north, yeah. south, and west, you know, maybe there is uh, some survival benefit there as well. Uh, my daughter will never, never let me order the same meal, same dish that she has ordered. There's always used, you know, always need to be diversity in, <laughs> in the ordering pattern. So, I mean, you're dealing with a lot of young people. Do you think there's a difference between young and older people? Uh, so we, it, it's interesting. Uh, we quite see it in uh, my uh, studies, but we did not look for it. So we, we did not look at uh, age effect. There is a, a reason to believe that there is more exploration among uh, young people. Uh, in, in particular, if you think about how the like, society organizes uh, uh, itself, uh, uh, people who are uh, uh, not parents, okay? uh, they can go explore. Okay? They, uh, if they don't come back, then there are no uh, uh, small children that are left with uh, no uh, supervision. Okay? So uh, society is uh, in a way organizing it itself such that uh, people with less responsibilities are the explorers. Now, now this goes, of course, like back in time. Okay? But when we look at the modern society, we still see that the, the, the people that go uh, explore the world and, and the backpacking, and they, they tend to be people with less social responsibilities. They are they don't have young children. They might have less responsibilities at, at work. Uh, we count on them to find out these like new territories, okay, new options, to try out the new foods and new fashions that if it works out, then you know, we will join later. Yeah, so I want to ask you, this is not in your research. I was just curious about this. So um, if you look at Scandinavia, you know, Norway, Sweden, look at a country like uh, New Zealand or a country like South Korea, 
that appears to be more uniform in their uh, in their stance, so to speak. Um, do you see a difference um, between those countries? I mean, there's a scale issue here, you know, if you compare to China or India or the US. But if you compare them to, let's say, UK, UK is pretty diverse. Germany is getting really diverse. So mm. do, do you see there's a difference? What comes to mind is Michelle Galfin's uh, work on uh, uh, wool followers and, and wool breakers. And basically what she finds is that some societies uh, are uh, more uh, more likely to follow rules. They are more uh, unified. The, the value is that you should uh, behave like other people and you should follow the, uh, the norms. Uh, this is where uh, uh, people try to appear uh, more similar to each other uh, when, uh, uh, you know, uh, people might only uh, cross uh, uh, in like uh, green light. Okay, they, they will follow the traffic uh, 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 laws and, and this is just one set of rules that people follow. And then there are the societies where uh, people are more likely to, to break the rules and, and innovation and, and like, being different is uh, is more valued. Uh, you uh, you see that in in places like Singapore, there is like more emphasis on on following uh, the rules. In in places like you know New York, uh, there is uh, much less uh, uh, general tendency to uh, to follow the uh, the rules and. Uh, and you think that it's uh, it's only your personality. You think that you are a wolf follower or a wolf breaker until you realize yeah. that you grew up in a place and you're part of a culture that taught you to behave in a certain way. Yeah, so you you may know a little bit about so you know, I was always wondered about Israel, for example, the sort of innovation coming out of there. It is it appears to be sort of a rules based society. Uh, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. yeah, Israel is not. Uh, they, they, it is not about following rules. Okay, no. is uh, <laughs> it is about uh, a disagreement and uh, and an argument. And you know, I like uh, one of my uh, professors when I uh, was uh, in grad school, I uh, famously said that if someone disagrees with you, that means that they that they see you. Okay, <laughs> that that they are engaging <laughs> with you. Okay. If they say, yeah, yeah, I, I agree with what you said, no, they, they might not even listen. Okay. Now, I, I think that this is a very Israeli attitude. I can tell you that when I uh, the, see my parents, like, basically my dad is going to disagree with me within the five minutes that, that we meet. Okay. It will be about something, about the weather, about the traffic, about something. Okay. So, yeah. So it's very much a culture where disagreement is the way to knowledge. I hear you. I'm with you. I'm your friend. Yes. Yeah, I'm a very disagreeable person. Uh, you know, so, you know, uh, I have you know, a lot of WhatsApp groups and the only thing that interests me is are things that I don't agree with. Everything else seems sort of okay. <laughs> and there are a lot of things I don't agree with. So that makes life interesting. Yeah, it's it, you know the, the problem is that uh, uh, then you meet someone from a culture of agreement, okay, and they think that uh, that this is a sign that you don't like them, okay, that, uh, That's right. that you don't That's appreciate right. what they have to say, and you kind of need to explain. No, it's because I appreciate you, because I like you. This That's is right. why I'm trying to find the disagreement so it, we can have a conversation, we can have a debate. Okay, it's not everywhere, and this is definitely something that cultures and also cultures within organizations uh, vary in terms of how much they they value the debate as as a way to socially connect uh, versus as something that should be avoided at all cost. So there were debates, uh, you know, when I was growing up, we had fierce debates about politics. This is in the sixties and seventies in India. Um. I feel like we don't have debates anymore. I mean, we have people shouting at somebody else on TV. You know, they're just expressing their opinions, which is fine. But debates, uh, debate is a unique skill, isn't it? I mean, you take uh, the opponent's arguments and you show why that might be wrong, right? I mean, it's an analytical pr 
process debate. And uh, it seems to be uh, sort of going away now. <laughs> People just shouting nowadays. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, debate requires good listening skills, and it's something that we are just uh, starting to get into the how to teach people to uh, truly listen. Okay, one exercise that I run in my classes is uh, I, I think putting people in pairs, and then I, I tell uh, uh, you know that the pair, like one person should be telling a story, and the other person should try to distract them. Okay, and not let them finish and not, not let them let go with their like ideas. And then they switch the you know, like places and I say, well, right now that the second person is going to tell a story and, and the first person is going to listen like you've never listened before. Okay, listen like you really want to understand what the other person is is trying to say. And and, and then we look at the experience of of the person that was either listened to. Or uh, uh, had the experience of what you describe, of like someone is not really hearing me, they are just distracting me, they are just yelling at me, okay? they're, they're just arguing with me, but it's it's not really coming from like a place of, of deep listening. And if you tell people to try hard to listen, mm. even without uh, uh, teaching them how to do that, most people can do better. And so I'm concerned that a lot of times, the, the reason that we don't, hear the other side that we don't have good debates is because people don't have the motivation to uh, listen but beyond motivation you also need to, to practice you, you need to learn how to you now ask clarification uh, questions and uh, make sure you you truly understand uh, that you really hear the other person and only then present other ideas it's an art form and you need to practice a lot to get better at it right so I mean, uh, debates are very mathematical, very analytical, I would say. Real debate, <laughs> not shouting matches. And uh, we used to have them, but we don't anymore, it looks like. So I want to go into one one more paper, and then we will get into your uh, recent book. Um, I found this really interesting. Surprise elaboration, when white men get longer sentences, you see here, we present a new consequence of stereotypes. They affect the length of communications. People say more about events that violate common stereotypes than those that confirm them. A phenomenon uh, we dubbed surprise elaboration. Um, yeah, I, I, can, I can understand this. Um, so everybody has an expectation, and you you basically get... Uh, surprised when your expectations are not met, right? I mean, you, you so you the, your expectations are built up over time. A uh, lot of <laughs> lot of cases, lot of events, and then you have an average expectation. You have some standard deviation around it, and when something falls outside that three sigma, you say, "Oh, well, you know, there's something wrong here." Is that the way to think about it? Yes, uh, when uh, something is not as you expected, uh, you elaborate. You, you you stop to think. Okay, you, you you spend some time on it. Okay, it's that uh, often like you know, the most trivial thing. Okay, it's like, like something is. Uh, you, know, you, you see, uh, I recently went to the the grocery store and I saw white strawberries. Yeah, okay, you stop. You stop to think like, well, what's going on here? Why why the strawberries are we, they. I mean, they they were supposed to be white. Okay, it was a new type of strawberries. Okay, yeah. and uh, and so you elaborate here. I'm telling you about that. Okay, and the, the thing with uh, you no know, stereotypes is that they often tell us what to expect. Okay, so we often expect that uh, uh, minority groups uh, uh, will suffer in some ways that they will uh, be uh, behind on, on income, on, on education, that they are uh, going to uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, be more likely to, to commit crime. And, and these are like expectations based on, on stereotypes okay, that we might even disagree with, but we still learn it at, at one point. And when something that goes against the stereotype happens, we stop to elaborate a little bit more, yeah. okay? And and that means that when you elaborate more, I can know that 
you have the stereotype that led you to be surprised. And so like th this is very abstract. What does that mean? Okay, We, we looked at uh, uh, how much people write, that is uh, police officers write, when a child goes missing, okay, and we know that uh, the, we know the race of the child, we know if they are uh, black or, or uh, uh, Latino uh, or uh, white, okay, and we see that the descriptions of white kids are slightly longer, mm. okay, and so we we wonder like why why did you uh, uh, mention these uh, few more details, okay? Why did you actually describe the, the details of what was on this child's uh, shirt, okay? Or like that the, the fact that they were wearing like this particular type of shoes and like that. What's going on here? And, and we think that this is a, a an unconscious uh, uh, bias that results from saying more because this in a way, surprised the person that was writing the, the report. They were expecting the minority uh, uh, child uh, to to disappear more than uh, the white kid to uh, uh, to disappear to over to to run away from home. This is how uh, most kids uh, uh, disappear. So, you know, we we looked at that. Uh, we uh, we looked at how much. In our experiments, people elaborate when uh, uh, something is uh, is not as they expected based on, on stereotype. By the way, it's not always said, okay? It's not just about kids uh, uh, going missing, okay? We also found that the New York Times was uh, writing longer articles uh, when gay couples were getting married, okay? So when when they write, write about weddings, say, okay, when this is sufficiently important uh, uh, to become a piece in a... Uh, in the paper, uh, it is longer for gay couples than than straight couples because uh, they they are so surprising. Okay, it's uh, uh, in a way it it gets the attention of the uh, the reporters, which uh, uh, as a majority uh, uh, tend to be uh, straight. Okay, uh, and, and so whether it, it it's for good things or for bad things, when something is not as you expected, you say more, and that uh, uh, can reveal your stereotypes. Let me also add that this could be a problem because when we say more, then our audience tends to think that this is more important. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so when when the report on the child that goes missing is longer, the audience, okay, the people that might look for that child might think that this is more important. Okay, and this is also something that we document. And so they don't say, oh, like the, the person that I got into all these details because they were surprised. They said the person were giving me the, exactly the pattern of the child child's T-shirt because it's very important to find that child because it's it's, it's a case that uh, that has to be uh, resolved. The child has to uh, uh, be found and, and uh, reunite with uh, their parents. And and that's a bit disturbing, okay, is that our stereotypes unconsciously lead us to to say more in some situations more than others, and that our audience thinks that this is an indication of how important is something. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's duration and frequency. Our politicians are very adept at this. So if you keep saying somebody stole the elections 100,000 times, that is that is good effect, you know. You, you have to keep saying it. You have to keep saying something many, many times, and it sink in. Yes, yes. Which is the, this is the effect that you know, the more you hear it, the more it's convincing. Okay, it's just that it becomes familiar. Uh, it, uh, therefore, uh, uh, it's more real in your mind. Uh, it's easier to remember, and what's easier to remember feels like it, it's more real. So. Yes, we, we see in the persuasion literature that just repeating arguments again and again, uh, something that sounded completely uh, impossible the first time, but the 100th time will sound like, well, yeah, that's quite possible. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So just repeat, repeat the crazy statements and they will become less crazy in your mind and the mind of others. <laughs> you tend to, tend to accept it. Um, and so I want to finish up with your book, your recent book, uh, Get It Done, Surprising Lessons from the Science of Motivation. I was I was skimming it, Caleb, and um, my computer died, so I didn't get to, <laughs> get, to get the most of it. But um, 
motivation that, that you talk about two types of motivation there, right? Intrinsic and sort of extrinsic motivation. So could you talk a bit about that? Yeah, well, you know, let me first suggest that you'll get the, you know, the <laughs> yes. actual copy of the book. And the nice thing about books when you can hold them in your hand is that they will not crush. Okay, so uh, <laughs> Uh, just kidding. I also like to uh, to read things on my computer on, on, and on my uh, Kindle. Okay, but uh, my uh, my recent book, uh, uh, Get It Done, is really a framework to uh, uh, to motivate yourself to to motivate uh, uh, others. It's a kind of a summary of uh, uh, over twenty years of research on uh, uh, motivation that uh, that I did, that my colleagues did. Uh, it's an exploding field, and I. I think that you're asking specifically about uh, uh, intrinsic motivation, which is just uh, a part of the uh, the book. And uh, uh, intrinsic motivation uh, is basically the, the motivation that we get from from doing something. So often we are motivated because there is a prize. So if we do something, we will later get the reward. Okay, so I, I will go to work, and by the end of the month, I will get that uh, paid. Okay, but we're also motivated from doing things, okay, from uh, doing the work that might be interesting, okay, that I might do it with people that I like, there might be social interaction. So uh, for most of the things that people do, there is uh, some, uh, some extrinsic and some intrinsic. There is some rewards for doing it, but it also feels right, feels good, feels like you're developing, feels like you're connecting uh, while you are uh, doing it. And we care about intrinsic motivation because it predicts engagement usually better than extrinsic motivation. So mm -hmm. to give you the example of food, uh, whether people eat healthy food depends on whether they were able to find food that they like that is also healthy because what predicts food consumption is taste, okay, much more than any long-term reward. Okay? You eat something because it's in front of you and because it tastes good. If you can find that healthy food that you can put in front of you and that you will enjoy, you will eat it. Okay. If you dislike healthy food, uh, you don't eat it. That goes to, to work, that goes to exercising, that goes to like managing relationship and, and finance. The more you make something intrinsically motivating, the more uh, people will, will engage and persist and so there will be more stamina. So, so let me understand this. Say it. So, intrinsic doesn't require sort of external um, objective function. Is that the way to think about it? So, when, when you're, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, when you're intrinsically motivated, that when you yeah. can still think about the the goal that you are pursuing, but doing it and, and achieving this goal becomes one of the same, okay? Like they are, what we use in the literature is the concept of fusion, okay? They become fused, okay? It becomes the, the thing that you do, okay? So I, I can ask you, uh, uh, why do you have, uh, you know, a, a, a debate with uh, your best friend? And you can say, uh, because I want to, to connect with them, but it's really like as you are having this conversation, you are connecting. Okay, it's like the thing happens, like the goal is achieved as you are pursuing the action. Okay, I know that if you are excited about your job, I can ask you why. Why do you work on this project? And you can say because I, you know, I want to develop my skills. I, I you know what I, I want to discover something new. But you're you're developing your skills. You're discovering something new as you are doing, okay, it becomes one of the same thing, which is very different than, you know, doing your job because by the end of the month you will get paid, in which case the, the goal is clearly removed. It's clearly not part of engaging in the activity. Hmm. So uh, if if I understand this correctly, um, correct me if I'm wrong. So extrinsic motivation is more quantitative in the sense that it has an objective function, it has parameters I can optimize. Intrinsic is sort of a little bit squishy in the sense that it is you uh, who is making these decisions, apparently based on 
not really quantitative metrics. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just making this up. Yeah. Sure. Like I, so I, I, I think I understand what you're saying in a way that they got that we can give rewards and they are external and they uh, uh, may motivate people to, to do something. But, you know, let me stay with the example of employment. We know that there yeah. are different things that people are looking for at, at their job. They are looking for you know, getting paid. They are also looking for opportunities to grow and uh, a social connection. OK, and uh, it, the you can increase the opportunity for social connections using some parameters okay you, you can uh, put people together okay you can uh, organize uh, more uh, opportunities to uh, to interact and that increases intrinsic motivation okay uh, you can uh, pay people uh, more and uh, uh, that increases their extrinsic motivation by the way I don't want to confuse anybody too much, but I would say that if you take the same payment and just give it sooner, give it to people as they engage in the activity, that actually increases their intrinsic motivation because that brings the, the goal closer to pursuing the activity. In the extreme case, we can envision that the person who's like the gambler in, in Vegas, okay, they are actually intrinsically motivated to gamble because the, the game and the reward are one of the same, okay? That they, it happens at the, at the same time. So I, I really look at whether the doing it and achieving the goal happens at the same time and is, is hard to separate, in which case the person is, is intrinsically motivated or whether it is uh, separated. Let me give you uh, one more example. It's kind of a funny example, but I think it will illustrate that. Let's take yeah. something that is really intrinsically uh, motivating for most people, which is sex. Okay, so couples engage in, in sex most of the time because they are intrinsically motivated to, to do that. Okay, there are no rewards. Okay, uh, but Sometimes there are uh, rewards. Uh, couples uh, may try to to conceive, and then they engage in like timing this activity and and being like uh, very uh, careful with uh, uh, you know uh, measuring uh, the the right parameters and and doing it uh, uh, at the right time. And then the same activity that for most of uh, the, the lives of the couple was intrinsically uh, motivating, can become less intrinsically uh, motivating and more extrinsically uh, motivating because now it's uh, it's goal-driven, okay? Now there is some long-term goal that they are pursuing. Yeah, there's, a, there's an objective function, really. Yes. I mean, so, mm -hmm. yeah. so intrinsic motivation is sort of happening inside, Extrinsic motivation is more of an engineering problem. It's an optimization problem <laughs> in some ways. Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with either, I would imagine. But um, so if we look at the population at large, um, so we'll finish up with this. Um, do you see a difference between intrinsically motivated people and extrinsically motivated? I, I'm thinking more, you know, sort of, you know, people employed in larger context. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the intrinsically motivating people have a better chance. Okay? They, are, they will uh, do more and they will stay on the goal over time. Uh, we looked at, uh, this is uh, again with Caitlin Woolley, we looked at New Year's resolutions. Here we are uh, recording this at the beginning of the year. So this is just after people set these resolutions. Uh, what predicts whether people are going to pursue the resolutions Throughout the year, when we measured in March and June and up all the way up to the following November, uh, is intrinsic motivation is whether doing it feels right, feels good, how much they enjoy doing it. Now, it's interesting because people don't set resolutions that are necessarily intrinsically motivating. Okay, like no one resolves to eat more ice cream and watch more TV. Okay, yeah. people set resolutions because they are extrinsically motivated to do it, but those that are also intrinsically motivated, those that enjoy doing it, that found a way that is uh, immediately rewarding, uh, are uh, those that are going to stick to these resolutions uh, throughout the year. So, uh, yes, there are individual differences, and uh, 
you want to be the, the person who is intrinsically motivated? Yeah, I should learn more about this. So the, <laughs> the extrinsic motivation, so I'm, I'm thinking about the corporate context, your MBA students, mm -hmm. and when they go out to work for a corporation, um, they're better off sort of satisfying the objective function of the corporation, right? I mean, it is very clear what they have to do. And it's it's easier to sort of follow the, the path. Intrinsic motivation seems like noise in the corporate context. I wouldn't say that. I think no, that intrinsic motivation I'm is... Just, uh, I'm just trying to create a debate. I yeah I I you know this is the uh, the popular concept these days is quiet quitting. I quiet think that quiet yeah. quitting happens because people resolve to the idea that that work is only about extrinsic motivation. That work is only about uh, making enough money so that I don't need to be there. Okay. Uh, that's uh, a very limited motivation and that uh, uh, we know uh, something that leads uh, a generation of people to uh, to give up on, on work as, as a place of personal growth and, and social connection because they you know they, they are only thinking about the, the extrinsic uh, uh, motivation. So when I talk to future managers, I uh, very much emphasize that your role is to uh, bring back the intrinsic motivation. Yeah, and, and we're changing, right? I mean, it used to be that you go work for a company like Pfizer or GM, and then you stay there for 50 years and you retire. That isn't, doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> um, yeah. There are people hopping from job to job. Right. Uh, I mean, that is the sort of a status quo. Mm -hmm. So there, the sort of the extrinsic motivation of definition and precision and low volatility have gone gone away. Right. I mean, it's only intrinsic motivation that remains. Yes, and uh, and it, it is more challenging to get people to feel intrinsically uh, motivated when uh, uh, they're only here for a short time. And so this is something that uh, uh, managers uh, everywhere are, uh, are either thinking about it or ought to, to think about it. How, uh, uh, how do you make someone feel that, uh, that they belong, okay? that they are welcome, that this is a, a place to, to connect uh, when the mindset is, I'm just going to be here a little bit and, and then uh, uh, move on, but but it's possible, okay? Like you know, our, our now our MBA students are only here for a few years, and uh, I, I, we, we still, I hope, uh, uh, make them feel like uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the place for them, and they belong here, and this is uh, uh, like in a way uh, a life a lifetime. Uh, uh, belonging uh, uh, that will keep when they are not here. And so we, we try to make education intrinsically motivating. Yeah, I, I remember you taught in Singapore for a little while, right? So yes. And I want to ask you about sort of the cultural nuances that you found between Chicago and Singapore. Well, uh, I teach uh, uh, in Singapore a very international program. I think that Singapore, to begin with, is a very international place. <laughs> and uh, 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 the program that I teach is uh, uh, is very international. And I teach business people who are, to begin with, uh, very international. So while cultural differences are definitely, you, know, you can still observe them. Okay, uh, you can you know see things such as that, like that the modesty uh, for uh, you know Asians in particular, like Chinese, that are often uh, very careful not to show off, not to ever suggest that they know uh, well, everything that they know. That's not changing now. <laughs> that's not changing now. <laughs> that's that is different. Yeah. Yeah, that is, you're right, that is starting to change. Yeah, it, yeah. it used to be even more uh, uh, extreme, but you still see that. 
Okay, uh, and then you know, business things are all changing uh, uh, more quickly. You see that the differences in terms of like rule breakers versus rule followers. Uh, uh, you see the individualism. Okay, how comfortable people are uh, working uh, as a team. Okay, uh, working together uh, in in Asia uh, more than in the U.S. And and so you yeah the, you see the cultural differences, but. For me, given that I work with business people that are all over the place, they are just uh, too uh, uh, too used to uh, uh, jumping between cultures. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we are sort of getting to the getting to the commonality, right? In many ways. So, excellent. This has been great, Ailet. Thanks so much for spending time with me. Yeah, thank you for uh, having me. I I hope that. Uh, now, your audience will like our conversation. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.